Hey everybody, Danielle Hargan Raider here. Welcome to another episode of Unleash Your Inner Diabetes Dominator. Today I have a really special guest, a mother of people of someone with type 1 diabetes. So I think this is going to be really valuable. And I think a lot of people out there are going to know who she is. So Laura Villado is the Vice President of Education and Programs at Children with Diabetes Incorporated. She has organized every Children with Diabetes conference since the very first Friends for Life event in June of 2000. This includes 65 conferences in the US, UK and Canada. This past July 2015, Children with Diabetes presented their 16th Friends for Life International Conference in Orlando and drew families from across the globe. Laura is mom to Sam, who was diagnosed with type 1 in 1998 at age 8 and now successfully lives and works in New York. She is also mom to Carolyn, age 26, who has developed and continues to present the Siblings Program for Children with Diabetes Conferences. Laura has a BA in psychology and an MS in education and speech pathology from the University of Michigan. At the time of Sam's diagnosis, she was serving at both state and national levels in communication associations, and she believes that strong communication and support are key to living well with type 1 and organizing unique family events. So, Laura, how are you today? Thank you for being with us. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm really glad to have you on. So, um... I'm sure a lot of people out there watching, they're used to my interviews or people with living with diabetes, but I think your unique perspective is very valuable to many people out there. So if you would be willing to share your kind of, I usually say your story of diagnosis, but it would be your son's story of diagnosis and kind of your intro into the world of living with diabetes. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, it really was our family's diagnosis. It wasn't just Sam's because all of us were thrown into it. So he, it was August, August 28th, 1998. It was the first day of school for Sam. And he woke up in the morning, came down to have breakfast and kind of took me aside and said, uh, Mom, can you come upstairs and look at this? And I went up to his room and he had these dark blue sheets on his bed. And he had never, ever the bed when he was a kid and there clearly <clears throat> excuse me clearly in the middle of the bed was a wet spot that had dried and around the edges of it were crystals white crystals not good um, he also had lost a whole bunch of weight in the summer and he had been really thirsty at summer camp had complained of stomach aches was just fatigued and we thought oh well good it's a really really busy active summer camp and he's, he's just tired at the end of the day. So he went to school that morning and we came home, or he came home and I made a doctor's appointment for him and we took him at around two o'clock in the afternoon. And the doctor sent him into the bathroom, did a urine test and came out and doctor's face was just white as a sheet. And he said, Sam's got diabetes. I have to send you to the emergency room at Mott Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor. And that was it. We got in the car and we drove to the hospital. And I remember Sam sitting in the back seat of the car asking me, Mommy, am I going to die now? Oh, my gosh. How do you answer a question like that? And, and I said, you know, if you were going to die now, the doctor would not have had me driving the car. He would have called it. Yeah. So I'm driving the car. That's a good sign. But let's get to the hospital and see what this is about. So he was admitted to the hospital. We spent two nights there, spent every waking moment of three full days learning about management of type 1 as it was in 1998. And I look back now and, oh, my goodness, the, the tools of the trade were like from the dark ages. And I just, my one memory of that first night is that our wonderful, wonderful diabetes educator had come in with the Pink Panther book. I know exactly put it in what you're talking about. Right. You know, everybody knows that book. Put it in my hands and says, you have to read this because this is a great resource. And so I thought that I had to read the whole thing before they would let out of the hospital. So I said, <laughs> all night just turning the pages one after the other and in the morning I had no idea what I had read and I was in tears when she came in because I, I thought that I was a failure because I hadn't learned anything 
So that was our first day with our first three days with type one. Yeah. Very scary. Yeah. And you said a lot of things that, you know, even though I was diagnosed in 1991 um, and the thing that you said about the technology being different is just, you know, it's insane. The changes that we've seen and insane in a really good way. I'm very grateful for technological advances, but I know the Pink Panther book. And I, it's funny because I had the similar, a similar experience that your son had is that I, I never wet the bed. And then all of a sudden, I started wetting the bed and that was actually one of my symptoms too. And I don't think that they don't usually, they, they list excessive thirst and excessive urination as symptoms, but they don't kind of list that, you know, all of a sudden wetting the bed. And I think that I've heard this a number of times and that might be uh, a good thing to kind of put on the symptoms watch list because I know that that has happened to a lot of people. And a lot of times parents just might think, Oh, well, it's just weird. They had a bad dream or they had something weird to eat or something, but it's a good thing to watch out for. And, um, and I think also a lot of parents probably experience the same thing as you do is that they, A, are completely overwhelmed and B, they feel like a failure. Although the failure you were saying about, you know, it was because you hadn't learned anything, but I think parents, and especially from, I have an amazing relationship with my mom and my dad has passed away for, you know, a long time, 20 years, but my mom, you know, she, for a long time, she felt guilty for me having diabetes like as if she had done something wrong and I always tell him like mom you couldn't have done anything better you're you're an amazing mother and but I think a lot of parents experience that guilt did you did that go further than just that first night for you our story I think was a, a little a little different than other people's I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes for two pregnancies that I had, and I actually lost a full-term baby in 1986 um, as a result of my gestational diabetes and lack of taking care of it, just no education, poor health care. And I'm, I'm the statistic of what you never want to happen, and it happened to us. And so the last time I had been in that hospital, in that place, had been this horrible, horrible experience of losing a baby. And then here we were in the exact same place, same smell, same sounds, yeah. same everything, except now we had a child who was going to live. And there was an answer and there was technology. So we just thought, oh, thank goodness somebody has answers for what we can do with this to get him healthy and bring him home again. So, you know, I hope that nobody else goes through the kind of experience that we had because it, it was just awful. But I also think that that experience prepared Neil, Neil's my husband, Neil and I for coming to the hospital that day with Sam and being able to look at things very optimistically and knowing that there were things we could do to keep him alive and get our family back on track. Yeah, yeah, and that's to say, I say all parents who live with children who have diabetes or any type of illness that requires the kind of constant around the clock monitoring that diabetes does. I mean, I think, I mean, for me, I call the diabetes dominator mentality, that's kind of my thing. And I think that anybody, not just people that live with diabetes, it's people that care for people with diabetes that have that same mental, strength and stamina that's just like look this is what it is this is what we have to do let's do that and move forward and obviously you and your husband have that same mentality and it's very important to have and um, I commend you and honor you for it because I know it's not easy uh, to live with that kind of pressure all the time so um, yeah interestingly uh, when I talk about that I I know that that story takes us a little bit off track but I am amazed at the number of moms and dads who come and talk to me about similar experiences they had. And as you pointed out, where you, you have had something difficult happen to you, where you really have to draw upon your inner resolve. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe it's diabetes, maybe it's something medical, maybe it's something entirely different, but you find that place in yourself to draw from and, and that's how you stand up again and move on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big believer in, you know, I, mean, I don't love it, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But the thing is, is I kind of think it's like a, the things that you go through in your life, regardless of, you know, if they're great or they're terrible, they shape you into who you are. And they are kind of, like you said, a wellspring of this kind of feeling that you can 
dive into and pull from to say, look, well, I know I can handle this and I know I can handle this. So I know I can handle this. And it's like a, I think it's a, a source of strength that we have. And I think adversity is a huge builder of, you know, inner strength and inner kind of fortitude that, you know, that feeling of like, hey, I can get through this. And um, I, I believe that probably most parents uh, living with kids that have diabetes are kind of uh, experts in uh, identifying with that feeling. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it can feel very crushing. And I know some days it feels crushing for Sam, some days it feels crushing for me. Um, not a lot, of, but sometimes it's just a lot. Yep. You know? Anything that doesn't have any breaks is always going to be a lot. And that's what I always say about diabetes. Like for me, you know, I'm very grateful. I've gone through a lot of adversity with my diabetes. I've gone through an eating disorder and having, you know, being very overweight and feeling very more than any of that, feeling very negatively about myself, feeling negatively about my ability to live a normal life or whatever that means, or, you know, being able to live a long life. And that was a long time ago. And now I feel very positive. I feel like I, I say, and people think I'm crazy, but I say, I think maybe I'll get to live to be 150 with the technology, you know, we have coming out today and just the way things are advancing. But um, knowing that you've been through that feeling of kind of horrifying feeling. And then today it's like, I never, I rarely feel that. But like you said, it's like some days it's just like, I really just don't want to deal with this today. But <laughs> kind of have to, you know, I mean, you don't have to, of course, you can kind of give up your responsibilities, but then you also have to deal with all the consequences that come after that. And it's, right. to me, it's just not worth it. So um, I would love to hear a little bit about or a lot about whatever you're willing to share about kind of your journey on creating the children with diabetes friends for life conferences, which are, I was saying to you beforehand, I was just lucky enough to come to the master lab sessions. And I was only there for the opening night of the friends for life conference in the conference hall, which was, I took videos of it. And I did a master lab recap. And it was just the whole thing was just overwhelmingly joyous. Like it was just all these people together, kind of going through the same thing, having the same, you know, desired outcome, which is I want to learn, I want to grow, and I want to create lasting relationships with other people who are on the same journey as me, which for me, that's what life is about. So please share a little bit about how this all came to fruition. Sure, sure. And I love what you said. It's overwhelmingly joyous. It, it really is. Um, people laugh, cry, hug, scream, shriek. Yep. It's, it's overwhelmingly joyous. So, but it happened totally by mistake. So one of, one of the lessons that, that I have learned, and I know you're going to ask me three things at the end, but this is one of them, is the things that were important to you before diagnosis should still be important to you. And for us, travel was important. We have always been a family who has traveled and camped and gone to the beach and gone to Disney World and we didn't want to lose that part of what our family liked to do together. And so I had become part of this children with diabetes email network and, and online network and it, it was fairly crude because it was, well not crude, but it, you know, how many years, 16 years ago, 17 years ago, all we had was this support network where you signed in, you didn't know who you were talking to. It was sort of the early, like an early Facebook kind of a place. And I got my daily support from those moms and dads who I would talk to on this support network. And we were chatting about vacations or whatever. And I said, you know, holding my breath, we're going to go to Disney World in June of 2000. Does anybody want to come? And I thought, you know, maybe a few families might come, you know, a handful. We'll hang out, we'll go to the parks, we'll have a good time, our kids can hang out together. And people started responding to me. And first it was 30 people, then it was 130 people. Wow. And ultimately we ended up with 550 people <laughs> at the Sheraton Safari that weekend in June. And we filled up the hotel. It was amazing. Wow. And the fun thing is, if I can backtrack a little, I had called Jeff Hitchcock, who is the president of Children with Diabetes, and I, I was terrified of him. He's, he's the Jeff Hitchcock. And uh, 
And so I called him and I said, Mr. Hitchcock, could we make this maybe a CWD thing, a CWD event and put it under the CWD umbrella? And he said, mm, no, CWD doesn't do that. We're just, we're just on the internet. Okay, so people kept emailing me and kept saying they wanted to come to this weekend and I called him again. When we got to 300 people, I called him again and he said, okay, you can do it if you can find a sponsor that would help pay for something like a group breakfast or a reception or something where we could pull everybody together to share in one space. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want anybody, I didn't want to ask anybody for money. That's, that's just like the kiss of death for me to make me ask anybody for money. So I said, all right, who would I call? And he sent me a couple of names and the first two that I called, I hung up on because I was really nervous and didn't want to ask. And then the third person I called and got his voicemail and he didn't call me back and I called him again and I called him again and I called him again and the fifth time I called him and left a message and said, I'm not gonna bother you anymore. This is the last message I'm leaving you. And five minutes later, he called me and he offered us $10,000 wow. for some reception. And I went through the ceiling. <laughs> That was so much money. And so and his name was Steve Bubrick. I can give him a nod here. He was my, my first friend in the CWD community. And he wrote us a check. He was from Theracense, uh, wrote a check to sponsor our first breakfast. And all of us got together in one big ballroom, shared a meal. Um, then we shared the weekend going to SeaWorld and going to Magic Kingdom and hanging out at the pool. And it was a phenomenal, phenomenal weekend. And on Sunday, nobody wanted to go home because we had new family, right? Yeah. There's 550 new family members. Yeah. And so they, they all asked, how can we do this again? And I was working in the healthcare industry. I'm a speech pathologist. And I knew how to do a needs assessment. And so I sent out a short survey to everybody and said, what do you want? If we do this again, what should it be? And they wanted education. They wanted education for their kids. They wanted an exhibit hall so they could meet the people who are making the cool products. They wanted to talk to the researchers and they wanted child care. And so the next year in 2001, we tried to put all of that together and oh boy, did we make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, about a thousand people showed up like one of our big mistakes was you know those orange and green wristbands that everybody wears yeah. that friends for life have them then so we didn't know who had diabetes who didn't have diabetes we didn't have carb counts on the food uh -huh. um, Disney bring out cookies that were this big mm -hmm. we didn't have carb counts for any of that so that was our first get together was in 2000 and our first friends for life was in 2001 and then it became my full-time job running those conferences and the only way that it could be my full-time job is because there were about 200 volunteers behind it and they run the children's programs they um, they run registration they help with the it setup they run the exhibit area so I get to stand out in front of this amazing thing, but it's really all these great people behind me who make everything happen. And it's just amazing year after year. Yeah, I mean, you just said so many great things that are just life lessons. I'm big on kind of life lessons. And the first thing that stuck out to me was the fact that you needed to ask somebody for money. And I think that in the diabetes world in general, asking for help, when we need it, whatever type of help that might be, whether it is financial, whether it is emotional support, whether it is just, I need somebody to talk to, I don't want you to fix my problem, but I just need to vent. We have this kind of, <gasps> this like, oh, this like retraction of our being when we have to ask somebody for help. But 
the thing is, is that when we actually kind of come out of our shell, like you did, and you're like, I'm just going to keep calling and keep calling and, you know, getting that done and the kind of doing it over and over again, it's like, look, sometimes you're going to need to ask for help five, six, seven times. But when you do finally get that help, whatever that is that you need, it's going to be, you know, more than you ever expected it to be, which I just thought that was a fantastic little kind of life lesson. And I think that can be applied to tons of areas of living with diabetes for sure. And just, you know, the haphazardness of it just, you know, it's like, oh, I just kind of want to, what you were doing is you were fulfilling a need that you had. And it was a very valuable kind of need that not only you had, but all of these other families with diabetes had. And I, I just, I can't use the word value enough because it was just, there's so much of it to be had in here and just the insights and the sharing and the just getting together with a bunch of people who kind of live the same way that you do. And there's no explanation about why there's needles and why there's beeping and why there's, you know, why you need carb counts on cookies. You know what I mean? It's just, it's this kind of border that when you meet some other people that live with diabetes, it's like when you meet anybody, you're like, okay, well, eventually if I'm going to spend enough time with them, I'm going to have to explain X, Y, and Z. That takes that whole explanation kind of stage of things yeah. completely out of it. And so you were fulfilling a very valid need that you had, but in doing so, you served an entire community of people that were obviously desperate for that need to be filled as well. And it just created this kind of beautiful, you know, thing that it is now. And of course, just like anything, there's going to be growing pains, you know, no, no wristbands and no carb counts, but Hey, you know, that's kind of like, nothing's perfect right off the bat. And it's just like, just hearing the whole story. I didn't know this either. So I just think it's, it's just so awesome. I just love the whole thing. And I'm so glad that you, had the wherewithal to stick to it. Cause like you said, it wasn't just like, it just rolled out. Like you had a lot of things that you had to do. And um, of course the volunteers, I mean, I'm, I thank them. I'm sure everybody thanks them. And uh, you know, we all, I mean, I know that nothing big like that comes together without the help of many, many behind the scenes uh, people. So that's just a great story. That's just awesome. Yes. I have a, I have a funny story from, the first year in 2000 at the Sheraton Safari. So we were all poolside and we had our children in the water and some people were wearing early, early insulin pumps and, you know, big infusion sets with things hanging out. And, but we took over the hotel. So pretty much all the devices that you'd see around the pool were ours. And so at one point on Saturday afternoon, all these children are swimming and an infusion set floats up to the top. <laughs> and someone fishes it out and holds it up and says, all right, whose is this? We cleared the pool, all the kids lined up and we found who had lost an infusion set. But in any other, any other setting, it wouldn't have been funny nobody would have gotten it. And I don't, I don't know how people would have dealt with this, but to us it was hilarious because we all understood what everybody else was thinking. Mm -hmm. And we, we found the child who needed a new infusion set. I knew it wasn't Sam because I had totally wrapped his belly with mm -hmm. duct tape. That, that was how we kept them on um, back in 2000. I wrapped him with silver duct tape. Um, but I, I also want to say that that first gathering, and also in 2001, I came to it very selfishly because our family needed to meet other people. Sam needed to be around other kids. We're in a, a tiny community. Manchester has one other child with type 1 diabetes. And the school system wasn't informed. Families weren't informed. Um, you know, heck, I, I wasn't informed. I didn't know anything. So really selfishly, I came to those first conferences because of my need and my family's need. And now, now I'm more in the place of, I know how much I have learned and how much I get from being with thousands of people who all walk in the same shoes. And it's amazing to be able to share that with as many people as we can. So for me, now in 2015, the best part is 
standing back and watching it happen and watching everybody connect. And as you said, the, the exuberant joy, the overwhelming joy that people have being there together. And that's the best part for me. It is the absolute best week of the year to watch that all unfold. Yeah, I can only imagine how fulfilling it is to see that and know that that came. And I, I think selfish is okay because I think that most great things that are invented, whether they're actually things that are invented or um, groups that are invented or meetings, I think they are always invented out of a selfish need of the inventor to have that need filled, whether mm -hmm. it's you know, it, I think that's how anything great comes to be. But now to be able to get that level of fulfill, fulfillment and just kind of, you know, share the wealth, so to speak, it's just, it's got to be just one of the best feelings. I mean, for me, like I get to coach people who have diabetes and feel helpless or hopeless, uh, kind of like I used to. And then when they kind of get a better A1C or whatever it is they're after, because everybody I work with has completely different goals, believe it or not. But it's just that fulfilling feeling like, they didn't have to go through that for 15 years like I did, you know, they could kind of fast track it kind of like you. So you, you know, you went through all of this kind of, I need this and I need this. And now you kind of have this kind of ready made, you know, turnkey event where everybody can come and get that need filled. And that's just, it's just amazing. And your story that you just told about the pool reminded me of, this is my first time there as well, by mind you, I was just there last month and I was at the pool and it was the first day and I had won a scholarship through the Diabetes Hands Foundation. And the, they had an option for getting one of your bags taken by did Disney Magical Express. So I opted mm -hmm. to do it because it was like an option, but I didn't know how long it would actually take to get that bag delivered. So that bag that I had had my uh, sunblock in it amongst like other things that I would have needed because I got there the first day around 12 or one o'clock in the afternoon. And that first day there was no sessions and I was excited to just go to the pool. I didn't really know anybody else that was going to be there. So I went by myself and I have a Dexcom and I have an Omnipod. And so I didn't have any sunblock. But I thought, I'm a pretty personable person. Maybe I'll just lay near a family and I'll say, can I borrow some sunblock, you know? So I end up laying next to this family. And I, as I'm walking through the pool, I see lots of, like, Dexcoms. I see lots of different pumps. And I see a lot of people already there that have, you know. But there was also a lot of people that didn't because this is a Disney resort. It's huge. And there's a lot of people there. So I end up laying next to this Canadian family. They were really sweet. And I said, hey, uh, you know, I'm really sorry to bother you. I said, I just, I don't have any sunblock, you know, can, is there any way I could just put a spritz of it on my face so I don't, you know, look like a crazy tomato colored person tomorrow. They're like, oh yeah, sure. But can we ask you about what that is on your back? And they started asking me, I said, absolutely. They're like, yeah, we've been here for a couple of days and we've been seeing it everywhere. And, you know, we don't want to be rude and ask and, and be intrusive. And I told them all about the conference. I told them what was going on. They were like, oh, that makes so much sense. But the thing is, is that you get a chance to educate just by you know having that set on and you know not getting your bag so it was just a really fun experience for me too so seeing <laughs> you and standing there with all of all of your stuff all of your youth stuff yeah absolutely but that sh opens you up for other people to ask you the questions and that's that's what's so amazing yeah, and I think it's important too for, um, I think a lot of people with diabetes, at least um, I know for certain, because I kind of get the chance to work with a lot of younger girls, but I think a lot of people feel kind of closed off or maybe, and I don't know if the word shame is right, but maybe there is some shame in it, but maybe they just feel insecure or they feel like, you know, they're being scrutinized if people are looking. And I think that it's more helpful to kind of take a, look, this is a chance for me to educate moment nobody's judging. I mean, and if they are, who cares? You know what I mean? Who cares if somebody random person at the pool is judging your Dexcom? Like for me, I just don't care. But I think that 99.9% .9 of the time that person that's staring is staring, not because they're trying to be rude because they really want to know, like, what is that? You know, I don't know what that is. And I want to know. And I think we have a really unique opportunity to educate the public about what's going on. So it's cool. Yeah, so I think touched on something when you you were talking about body image and I don't I don't know that it's shame I think it's privacy um, I think people are private about their their bodies and what they might wear on their bodies put on their bodies and when you're at a place like friends for life that privacy um, it extends 
beyond your body. <clears throat> so now, excuse me. <clears throat> so now your privacy or your space extends to everybody around the pool or everybody around the convention center or everybody in the Disney park. Yeah. Because so many of you that you, you just don't feel that need to be really private in your own space, under your clothing, under your coat, in your purse or whatever. You can just show whatever you want to show and it's accepted in this place. Absolutely. And I think that's a sense of power. I agree completely. And I think, yeah, maybe not shame, but I think it is, is that, um, like I said, it's for me, it's mostly with young girls. I find the older, the people I get to kind of associate with, the more proud we become of our, you know, extra appendages, you know, whatever they are, they're, you know, the CGMs and the, and the, um, the pumps. But I think that, um, it's the, uh, when you're in your teenage years and in those kind of formative years, you're like, it's, it's, it's all you don't want to be is super different than everyone else. It's like, oh, you know, I have this different weird thing that feels weird. And I think it's just all a mental thing, really. I mean, because like I said, I don't think really most people are being negatively judgmental. They're just kind of wondering. But um, that is, that's, again, one of the great parts about the whole conference is that, look, we're all, we're all in the same boat here. So let's wear our, wear our uh, pieces with pride and take that as a chance to let other people know that we're a huge population out there. So <laughs> you might want to get used to seeing this kind of stuff out there on a regular basis. So yeah, it's really cool. So yeah, do you, I was going to say, before I get into asking you about your tips for thriving, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Because I feel like you probably just have an endless amount of awesome information and stories and experiences that you could impart. Is there anything else that kind of stands out to you that you think you might want to share? Um, one thing that I, I try and teach my kids and it doesn't particularly have to do with having diabetes, but it's more of an outlook on just living that everybody has something, everybody has something they're dealing with, something they're, they're proud of something they're working on, something that's painful to them. Um, everybody has a history that you may or may not know about. And they, they carry that with them. So you as a person with type one, me as a mom who has a son with type one, we carry that as part of what makes us who we are, makes us the good people and the strong people that we are. And we need to recognize that in everybody else and know that, yes, you have this piece that lives with type one, whether it's in yourself or in somebody you love, but that doesn't define you. That That is a part of you and you are so much more than that. And it is something that makes you stronger and in a lot of ways better. Yes. And so that's what I try and live by. That's what Sam tries to live by. I know that's what Carolyn tries to live by. So it's important. Everybody yeah. has something. I could not agree any more wholeheartedly with that. Everybody does have a burden to bear, whatever that is. And, you know, it's, whether you, you know, we don't want to be blamed for our burden, you know, obviously you can't blame anybody for type one diabetes or, or even type two for that matter. So you don't, there's no blame for it. But like, I think you hit the nail on the head there is that like, I really think that it kind of just boils down to, and this is kind of my thing is just love is that I think we all just need to show each other some love, whatever it is, and not be like, well, that person's out to get me. And, and, and most of the time, whatever you're feeling, you know, that person's judging me. It's like, they're probably feeling that about you 10 times over. And if you kind of just got past that, you probably end up being really great friends because yeah. we're all kind of in the same boat. We all get dealt kind of a crappy card in life or whatever you might want to, you know, or one crappy card or yeah, know? many of Lots them. Of yeah, I, I always yeah. tell people that too. It's like, you know, I have a lot of past experiences that people could and I'm very open with my story it's like you know my father passed away the day after my 12th birthday I was in deep depression eating disorder my sister was a heroin addict she passed away um I you know if I wanted to be sad and angry and it wouldn't be difficult it would be probably pretty easy for me if I wanted to just feel but I want to be happy and I want to share happiness with other people because I really believe that that's what life is about is about 
humans are meant to connect with each other. We're a communal society. You know, we don't, we, we, we were, you know, hunters and gatherers by ourselves and we lived like only like what, like 30 years, you know, of course, getting eaten by tigers and whatnot. But then we come together and realize as a group, we can accomplish so much more. And I think that that, whether it's the diabetes community, whatever community that it is, is that it's community. And I think that showing each other that love and respect, I really do believe that most human beings are good. Of course, there's going to be some bad seeds, but it, I think we should probably just try to embrace the goodness in each other and know that we, like you said, we all have our pasts and, you know, that makes us who we are. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to share that with other people. I think sharing is important. So, and what... So, and we're trying to hold a conference with 2,000 people or, or 300 people, whatever the size of the conference is. I really approach it from the perspective of, as you said, what we're after is happiness and knowledge and a good experience. So what is it that, that we can do, that I can do, that's going to make this better for you? What, what can we structure it like? What kind of social activities can there be? Who do you want to get together with them? In what kind of a format? What do you want to talk about? And along the lines of everybody has something, some people have other illnesses, some people have um, other things that make it difficult for them to be sitting in a session, but there are other ways for them to really benefit from coming to a conference or getting together with other people. So there, there are just so many ways to have a good experience at a place like Friends for Life. And that's why we ask for everybody's feedback. I mean it when I send that email after the conference and say, tell me what would make this better. I really want to hear your feedback. What was great? What wasn't great? And I have gotten so much feedback this year. We're going to do a lot of things differently next year. One of the things we're going to do differently is we're going to have a lot of meetups on Monday and Tuesday before things start on Wednesday and Thursday so that people have friends by the time they get into the middle of the week, that they're not just meeting friends on Friday night and saying, oh, gee, I wish I had met you on Monday. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. I was say, because I mean, I wasn't there for the whole thing, but I was there Monday and the master lab started Tuesday. And I mean, I knew a couple people, but I knew they weren't coming in, but I think that's a really great idea. Just, you yeah. know, with the ability that we have on, you know, internet groups, it's just so easy to say, hey, I'll be here, I'll be here. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. So cool. Right. And I think the bottom line is, is the question is, is that, and I ask, I often going into an interview or going into any kind of situation where I'm getting to work or associate with other people, I think the question is, and it kind of boils down to everything you said, is how can I serve? How can I better serve the person that I'm interacting with? And I think service is kind of like a, a term that gets, a bad name. I mean, doesn't mean that you have to like be down on one knee serving somebody. It's just how can I, with whatever, you know, qualities that I have, serve you and your needs with those qualities that I have. And I think service is a really good um, term to kind of get into one's vocabulary because when we kind of live to serve other people with our innate qualities, our lives just become so much more enriched. And um, I think people don't realize that every single person has a valuable service to offer to the world. And whether you know what it is or not, you have one. And um, I think when you recognize that, it becomes a lot clearer what life's all about. So, and I think that your conference just embodies that. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's not my conference, it's our conference. Thank you for the our conference, absolutely. Sweet. All right. Well, so let's uh, let's get to the end here. And uh, why don't you share with us what Laura's top three tips for thriving with diabetes are? I thought about this all weekend and I actually wrote them down. So perfect. The glasses on. <laughs> Have the drink of water. So the first thing is what I said earlier. Whatever you liked to do before you were diagnosed. Don't let the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes stop you from doing that. Diabetes is part of you. It isn't you. So you still have the things you like to do, the goals you have. Um, keep those. Keep those. So if you're newly diagnosed, uh, learn what you need to do to take care of yourself and to stay healthy. And then get on with life. 
Um, Sam is 25 and he lives in Brooklyn and he works in the coffee industry in a startup. And it has nothing to do with diabetes except for the fact that his roommate is a buddy from CWD. Nice. And yeah, that's very cool. They, they met many, many years ago and have been buddies ever since. Um, so he has a support community in New York, but otherwise he carries on with, with what's interesting to him in life. And he played hockey all the way through high school and just got on with things. So I think that's really important. Um, embrace your diabetes, take care of it, but get on with things. I totally agree. I always tell people, you know, that's, you know, again, that's kind of like the mentality that I had to adopt, the diabetes dominator mentality, because that's all it is, is the mentality is that the only, only thing that you need to do to have that mentality is to follow your passions, chase your dreams, and not let diabetes be the reason why you don't. And that's, I couldn't, that's like my number one kind of thing. So I'm really glad that you said that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then the second thing is really for parents and, and perhaps significant others be the safety net. So there are so many choices these days, especially with all the technology, all the different options for uh, managing your diabetes and staying really healthy. I've, I've taken the standpoint that it's important for me to help Sam understand the choices. And if it were my diabetes, I'd want to understand the choices. Um, but then the person has to choose. He has to choose what works best for him. It's not my choice. It's his choice. Um, but I have to be there in my mom's role. I always have to be there. When I'm 100, I'll have to be there as the safety net for my children, for whatever in life that is scary or challenging to them. So be the safety net is number two. Excellent. And then number three, um, Maura McCarthy taught me this one. She spoke at Friends for Life a couple of years ago. And she said, find a way to yes. And what that means for me is if Sam didn't have diabetes and he asked me to do something, if he could do something. If the answer would have been yes before his diabetes, it still has to be yes. We just find a way to make it work. So find a way to yes. And we've done that with um, pretty easy things and we've also done that with challenging things. So for example, when he went to college, he went to the University of Michigan, which is about an hour from here. And his freshman year, he wanted to live by himself in the dorm. Privacy, right? We're talking about privacy issues. He's a private person. He wanted his own room. Oh, every bone in my body said, no, I don't mm. want you to live alone. Uh, but he really wanted to. So how did we find a way to yes on that one? Texting and phone calls. So every night before he went to bed, he would text me and every morning when he got up, he would text me. I didn't need to know a number. I didn't need to know how he felt. I need to know he was up and breathing. Yep. And that was my line in the sand. If you can do that every single day, then yes, you can live by yourself. And only one day did he not do that. And one day did his dad show up at his door in the dorm room, knocking on the door at 7.30 in the morning because we hadn't heard from him yet. Yeah. Uh, but we found a way to do it, and he was happy, and it was a huge step for him in terms of being able to be on his own and then take that next step into moving really away to New York. Yeah, well, well, I must say you're very brave. Brave and uh, kind, obviously, person, and I, I think a lot of parents, would have a lot more um, reservations with that. But I mean, I had a very similar, my, you know, I lived on my own when I was 18, always in contact with my mom. I had a roommate. We didn't have the same bedroom. So, you know, like I said, I was always in contact. And I think that it, it comes down to you and your kind of your relationship that you have with your child is that if you are confident and you know that your child has good judgment and things like that, that, you know, you got to let them live their lives. Like you said, it's their choice. It's their decision. And, uh, yeah, you're, you're obvious. I'm sure Sam is very grateful for you. Um, just as we all are for all of your contributions to the, uh, 
diabetes world. So awesome. So thank you. I mean, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I know you're a busy woman. I'm all these conferences to plan. I can't even imagine the logistics behind that. <laughs> but um, is there anything else you want to add before we kind of sign off here? Sure. Was, this, was there anything else that you would like to add before we kind of sign off here? Oh, um, I guess just a plug that please find a way to try and come to an event. It doesn't have to be one of our events. There are so many ways to get together with other people in the diabetes community. And yeah, online is wonderful, but a hug is better. Yes, I agree. And, and find a way to do that because it will make your world just so much better. I agree. And uh, just for everybody watching, I'm going to get links from Laura to so you can check out the event and any other way that she wants you to be able to find out information from her. I will link that below the interview and on the blog. So don't worry. You didn't miss anything. You'll be able to just click right over. So cool. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you had as much fun as I did because I really enjoyed getting to know you. And um, we usually do here. We will just catch you guys on the next episode. Take care, guys.